Okay, uh, I'd like to begin my story by asking a question. Uh, can small island states such as the Caribbean, can we really become competitive in a globalized world? Um, and we begin with this problem of scale. And if you look at the Caribbean islands, they are all like small dots. And uh, we don't really have an opportunity to have a very big scale of production of anything. And so how do we overcome this problem of scale? Now, th this table, if you can see it, uh, basically tells you how limited land area we have per capita. That is, for per person, how much of land area is available. And if you look at right at the bottom, you see Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, it's estimated that we have only 83% of the area that is required if you want to become self-sufficient. So we don't even have the area uh, to become self-sufficient uh, with respect to food. Um, to make this thing more complicated is the risk scenario. And if you look at uh, the number of hurricanes, this is category five hurricanes that have passed through the Caribbean during the last uh, century. It's a frightening picture. It tells you the story of the vulnerability uh, attached to investment in the region. Uh, to make it worse, you know, we know the story about earthquakes, and, and it became a reality to us when we had the problem in, in ha Haiti. And it can happen to any of the islands because we are on a moving Caribbean plate. Um, so how then can, in face of all of these realities, how can we create a competitive society that can really make an impact in the global scene? 92% um, of the population in the Caribbean, we live in very small islands. Uh, and we just talked about the high prices of land, the limited land, the absence of scale, and the high cost of labor. Um, and of course, the investment risk. And how can we, so the, I'd like to first look at some principles that we should really look into before going into some examples that I would like to share with you. Now, do we really have something that we can call a comparative advantage that the rest of the world actually wants to get from us? I mean, there are lots of things that you can talk about. First, uh, I will say something about plants in general. Uh, on, on the top left-hand corner, you see the scorpion pepper, and you would know that in recent times, it's been rated as the hottest pepper in the world. So internationally, uh, since the release of this, there has been emails flying around looking at how we can exploit this uh, wealth. We know about the Blue Mountain coffee in Jamaica. It's already made a name, established itself as a very competitive industry. Uh, we know the high quality of cocoa that we have in Trinidad and parts of the Caribbean, and so on. The anthuriums, the moshata pumpkins, all of those have a sense of comparative advantage, gives us the advantage because it's indigenous to this part of the world, and we have some unique types that we can exploit. Now we can go on to the rest of the industry outside agriculture, and we can look at uh, the fashion, steel pan, maritime services, and cultural tourism, all of those can perhaps give us a comparative advantage. But can we just sit on these comparative advantage and create competitive industry? Uh, we need to develop what we, I, I call quality niches. How can we identify high value products from these? Uh, how can we create a system, intensive system, not extensive, that we can create value from these? And how can we move away from the mainstream market and create niche markets where we can get very high value for these products? So these are all ways in which we can further improve our competitiveness. I'll talk about the Anthurium uh, as I go along, uh, the story of the Anthurium. 
how we can use this in a very intensive production system where we can create wealth. And, and we'll also talk about niche products such as um, how can we target our cocoa, which is of the highest quality, into these boutique high-end high markets rather than going for commodity markets. Um, the third principle that I want to share with you is, is how can we, having identified these comparative advantages, what do we need to take this into knowledge industries where we can really use our intellectual knowledge that we have so much in the region and to create them into an industry that can become really competitive. Um, so in other words, uh, we are looking at, instead of producing flowers, for instance, on a large scale and exporting the flowers, can we export the new varieties to the rest of the world? So all you would need is a, perhaps a tissue culture facility where you can multiply them and distribute them throughout the world. But we need to have something that we can sell. If we can create something that we can sell, then we can sell it to the rest of the world. So that is what we call a knowledge industry. Uh, the fourth point that I want to share with you is how do we move up the value chain? Now, we cannot really work with commodity markets. If you continue to work uh, on the commodity level, we are not really going to make any, any businesses that are comp competitive, particularly when we are very small. If you are large, it doesn't really matter. Um, so I've just looked at the example. If you sell pepper as a commodity, you, you get only a limited amount of price. If you can move along to another level where we create pepper sauces, pickles, and so on, then you get much better value out of it. If you go one step further and you take this capsaicin, which is the pungency principle, and export that, you create even higher value. Or you could go one step further and create pepper sprays and health creams you know, using these capsaicin. And so how do we move our industries to the higher plane, so to speak. Um, the fifth principle I want to share is that we need to nurture the industries. All industries have potential, but if you don't really create a nurturing environment uh, to overcome all the problems associated with it and create the markets that we need um, and create the opportunities for trade, then these potentials remain as potentials. And nurturing has to do with R&D, trade facilitation, and so on, which we'll talk about. And how do we further improve our profits by direct marketing, the e-marketing opportunities that you can get so that you overcome the middleman and go through direct to the markets, the niche markets. So if you look at all of these together, what I have created is a scorecard. So how do we look at all of our industries and put them through this scorecard and determine which one should be prioritized and which one we should put all the limited wealth that we have into creating industries. Um, so I'm first going to look at an example. This, these are some of the things that have been very close to me because I've been working with them over many years. Uh, I looked at, uh, many years ago, at the an anthurium industry. And I looked at, this is an extremely high value, we, product. We have a tremendous amount of diversity in this region. It's tropically adapted. We, 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 have, we have intensive systems of production that we have developed traditionally. We have a history of cultivation. This has an excellent shelf life. It can last up to three months, if you couldn't believe that. And it's a huge industry with a market very close to us in North America, which, which has about two billion dollar market, and each bloom can sell at what, six US per bloom in the, in the retail market in the US. So this has a potential, but how can we change this potential into a reality? Um, the, the crop is affected by serious problems, diseases, the bacterial blights, the bacterial leaf spot, nematodes. And there's lack of new colors. First looked at resistance in the diseases, and we identified it very good. It, it, it's very variable depending on the variety you have. So how can we create something, overcome these problems, 
so that we can create, take this potential to the next level so that we can create some reality. Um, so we first looked at resistance to the diseases and we identified, we collected all the different variability in the region and we screened them and we found some really high levels of resistance which you can see on the right end compared to all that were susceptible. Uh, this is another disease. We also saw a lot of resistance uh, on that end. Uh, and if you look at the local varieties that they have, which, which are labeled LT, you see that they are much more resistant than all the exotic types of anthurium. So how can we transfer this resistance into the exotic type? So we developed a breeding program in collaboration with a private uh, anthurium farm in Trinidad called Kairi Bloom. And we created all these new varieties, and which are resistant to the diseases. They are very productive. They have attractive colors, very good vast lives, and so on. We said, how can we take this to the next level further? So we started looking at the biochemical pathway that controls the different colors in anthurium. And, and we realized you have uh, the pathway. It's a very simple pathway. You can modify the pathway to get reds, uh, blues, oranges, or yellows. And, and in anthurium, naturally, you know you have reds and whites and oranges, but you don't have blues, purples, and yellows. And we said that uh, if we can identify the genes and the control mechanism, then we can create these new colors that gives us a competitive edge that now we can really create a very competitive industry. So we said that uh, having uh, created any, uh, these, uh, solved the problem, created these novelties and so on, how do we build an industry from it? so that we can really create value to it. And so you will see that uh, creating new varieties provides us the opportunity to market these varieties instead of marketing blooms, which you have to grow them uh, in large scale. So can we create a system that we can multiply them in very rapid rates and really market throughout the tropical world? Because these varieties, because of their resistance, can be marketed throughout the world. Oh, and can we use these varieties in, in growers' system, create growers around these new varieties and market them uh, throughout the North American market? So again, when you look at an industry-wide scale, you realize that uh, R&D is only but one component which creates the potential, but then you need to really focus on development industry involving the stakeholders. Um, so we said that if we can create all of these en environments, we could create a perfect scorecard that can develop this industry into something that we can really market internationally and make revenue out of. The second example that I want to share with you today I is uh, cocoa. Now, cocoa, as you know, uh, many of you all don't know, probably know that Trinidad and Tobago has the largest collection of cocoa varieties in the world. We have a gene bank that contains over 2,400 varieties. Trinidad has been well known internationally for the research that has been done in cocoa, and most of the cocoa industries in the world were established out of varieties that were taken out of Trinidad and Tobago in, in the past century. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago and parts of the Caribbean enjoy very high quality, it's considered to be the highest quality of cocoa, and we fetch premium prices two to three times that of the rest of the world, which produces most of the cocoa. So how can we create this industry, which has so much of potential, into something that can become a revenue earner? Now, the, you might ask the question that, if this is such, such a lucrative industry, why is the industry in decline? That's poor productivity. The production is of very small scale production. We are on the wrong end of the business model. And uh, we, have, we lose a lot of uh, yield because of diseases. And we are not really added value to the industry. So how can we change this industry? And sorry. And the figure is not coming up. But basically, this figure here uh, is supposed to 
show you that the actual yields that we get at the moment are around 250 kilograms uh, per hectare, which is way, way below the potential yield we can get, which can go up to as much as eight tons per hectare or 8,000 kilograms per hectare. So we are getting 250, we can get 8,000 kilograms per hectare. So if you can increase our potential yield, we can reach the potential yield, then we can get increase our production 32 times, even without increasing the acreage. The reason why I said we are in the wrong end of the business model is because we are exporting our cocoa as raw material. We are exporting the beans, and we are the value is added uh, in, in Europe, uh, generally. And if you look at the amount of revenues that the farmers are getting at the moment, uh, the 1,550 at, on the right-hand column actually tells you how much revenue farmers get per acre or, or the profits they make per acre on a yearly basis. 1,550 US is not much. But if you go into direct exports, you can double that to around 3,850 US per acre. Now, if you brand our cocoa, we talked about branding earlier on, if you begin to brand the origin, we can increase our value to about 10,400 US per acre. If you go into producing chocolate, uh, even the farm gate chocolates, which are the lower end chocolates, you can make $100,000 per acre. And if you go into signature gourmet chocolate types, you can even go up to $350,000 per acre. So again, the whole value of the industry is on adding value. You know, if you don't add value, you are really at the wrong end of the business model. So uh, at the Cocoa Research uh, Unit, which I am at the moment have the privilege of heading, uh, the two things that we are really focusing on in our research is to increase production on one end, because without production, we really cannot be competitive. On the other end, how do you brand and improve value to our industry so that we get better value from whatever we produce? Uh, the last example I want to show you, with you is the hot pepper industry. Um, and uh, how do we build a hot pepper industry? We have these unique types, very high levels of pungency, very good flavor, internationally known. And if you look at the entire peppers, uh, the, the mainstay of the world, the pepper, is called the capsicum annuum type peppers. These are the chili peppers, the jalapenos, the sweet peppers. These are the ones that are the mainstay of the world. The ones that we have belong to another species called Capsicum chinense and Capsicum frutescens. Capsicum frutescens is your bird peppers. Capsicum chinense is the peppers that we know of as hot peppers in Trinidad. And these peppers have not been exploited internationally. Uh, Caribbean countries are one of the first to really exploit and export these varieties uh, to the world. So we have very unique in this respect. We have uh, a very, very lucrative industry, very good potential for it. But the problem with the industry has been the very low yields. Because we haven't really worked on these varieties, the yields that we get are around 10 tons per hectare, whereas these, the mainstay uh, of cocoa, the pepper varieties like the bell peppers, the, uh, or the, they, they you can get as much as 100 tons. So uh, our quest in research has been, how do we increase these yields from 10 tons per hectare to these really good peppers to 100 tons so that we can really make it uh, profitable? As soon as you increase your yields, immediately your cost of production comes down because the, the amount of money you spend to grow peppers is almost the same whether you produce 100 tons or whether you produce 10 tons. So that is what our focus has been. And we have collected a whole range of um, uh, varieties from throughout the Caribbean. We have purified the varieties and we have characterized them for various characteristics. And we're really surprised to see the enormous amount of variability that is there. And uh, uh, for instance, if you look at the pungency, you have from on one end no, non-pungent types, which are like the pimento types. And the other end, we have 1.5 million Scoville index, very high pungent types. So we have enormous potential to exploit these types. Resistance to viruses 
Among our viruses, we have varieties which are tolerant to all the five viruses that are found in the tropical world. So that tells you there's a potential to get resistance to these viral diseases. So the, the last uh, slide actually say that, you know, competitiveness, can we get competitiveness in the Caribbean? Uh, and the answer to that, uh, my answer to that is yes, we can. What do we need to do? We need to prioritize our industries. Uh, we need to create a vision around those industries. And we have to nurture the industries. And the nurturing the industries has to do with R&D on one aspect, but also uh, the government and the private sector have to come together uh, into one so that these industries can be nurtured so that they can become uh, value creators in the Caribbean. Thank you very much.